to Coming Down to Earth, uh, an online summit uh, uh, exploring pathways to more healthy and regenerative cultures. I'm here with Sophie Banks, um, who many will already know. Uh, she has an eclectic background, uh, engineer, footballer, therapist and grief worker. Um, and she held the inner uh, agenda in transition in the transition network for many years. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that very whistle stop tour. Sophie? Um, I sometimes I you know I have this weird background. What really interests me is human systems and how they work and and uh, I, I feel like a driving question for my life has been why we make unintended consequences. Why do we create so much suffering for ourselves and for each other, when I don't believe that it's anybody's deliberate intention to do that. Um, so I feel like, yeah, I've spent my life trying to unpack that and come to deeper and deeper understandings of it. Mm. Thank you. Which is, which is so perfect, particularly for this yes. week, week one, where we're looking at some of those the reasons for why we, um, why we struggle so much. Um, with with conflict exactly that, that that nobody wants and yet we seem to um, get ourselves into deeper and deeper holes with it. So what's 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 your approach? What is that kind of um, uh, viewpoint that you're coming from to with all of that? Uh, part of my journey was was start, you know was to start out in science and technology you know and um, I think it's interesting how much of our culture puts an emphasis on that as the place of knowledge and understanding. Um, and at a certain point, partly because of how I was in my own um, internal world and relationships, um, but also in this sort of bigger question about, you know, why was my family the way it was? Why are organizations the way they are? Why is our world so clearly on a, dis on a path of destruction and not responding? Um, I ended up uh, on, the, my, on a much more inner journey, doing my own therapy and then um, training as a therapist. And even in, that, even in that world, getting really interested in the systemic approaches. So, um, yes, so, so starting to see personal uh, unconscious so that there are parts of us uh, within us that are out of our awareness that are actually very powerful in, in organizing how we are and how we experience things and how we create relationships. Um, and, you know, as a psychotherapist, you learn to look at that at an individual level. I was also interested in family constellations and um, other different cultural approaches to pathology and healing, you could say suffering and its relief. Yeah. So, so I also started to see, <clears throat> and, and part of my experience, in my football team was looking at the systems of collective trauma you could say of collective um, disruption of things like race and class colonization gender sexuality mm -hmm. um, so I got really interested in that aspect and I think I was always trying to find people that were putting these different levels of scales together so uh, it seemed to me that people tended to focus on the individual and a lot of our culture tends to individualize difficulty mm -hmm. and, um, and see a person as the, as the place where the problem exists mm -hmm. if they're suffering. Um, so I was really interested in, in how we can move um, away from that and link across scale. So a person, but within their family, um, within organizations, within the institutions that are shaping our culture, and then, you know, the much bigger international, global, social uh, layers of, of systemic harm and its consequences. Mm. Um, and in a way, I guess you could say that's the question that I brought into the transition movement. Um, so, so I found myself in Totnes in 2006 at um, and, and got caught in the whirlwind of, you know, starting Transition Town Top Nest and set up the Heart and Soul group with Hilary Prentice. Um, and I think that was the question that I was bringing to that movement. If we're attempting to create a healing and a transformation in our communities, um, 
how do we understand the dynamics of destruction in myself, in our relationships, in our groups? How will they show up in the transition movement? Um, and, and how do we see these patterns mirroring across levels of scale, um, creating harm or creating good, you know, creating health and good outcomes and less suffering and healing and joy and connection or creating the opposite. Yeah, because it, it really, it changes the dynamic immediately in a, in a conflict that's in the room. If you allow those other levels in, if it's not yeah. just that, <laughs> that person who's really yeah. annoying you, but actually that, you know, there are, there are nested layers and layers of, um, yeah, other levels that are there with you in the room, even if nobody's really acknowledging. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of the maps I often take in if I'm doing conflict facilitation is that level of scale from personal to interrelational, and then there'll be the organization, which is often where the conflict is happening that I'm being asked to help with, and then the bigger layers of that organization within its context and then the social layers. And, and I think it does really help, you know, in, in many ways. Yeah, many um, ways of working with conflict would would want to bring those in yeah. otherwise it it's very difficult to get out of the kind of log jam of interpersonal stuff mm -hmm. when those dynamics are present so yeah mm -hmm. yeah and it is that that yeah having those models just um yeah again helps to depersonalize it and also give it context uh, and, and and a way of understanding what's happening and, and I know that you use the, the framework that, that around the, the way that our nervous system works and how that applies both individually and collectively. And I wondered if you could talk more about that model. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, th I think I'll start by saying uh, when I worked as a therapist, one of the things that I saw in the people I was working with and I recognized it in myself was that... Um, sometimes there would be this shift, a sort of sudden shift in somebody's uh, uh, state where they would go from a sense of confidence and, uh, and you can often see it in somebody's body, uh, a feeling basically okay and safe and connected and resourced and comfort, you know, self-worth. And then it's like something would happen or they'd be describing an incident that had happened and suddenly they were tripped into... Um, feeling under threat, feeling abandoned, feeling um, worthless, you know, whatever it was. And often people were, were switching without actually noticing that something had happened internally. Um, and a lot of the work I did in therapy with people and, and my own was about how to notice that that had happened and find a conscious way of coming back to that place where there's ground. Um, and I got really interested in that shift. Mm. Um, and I found some people who were writing about something that I recognized as that, like Starhawk sometimes talks about bad reality and good reality. Uh, and I think they're really interesting frames to look at. Um, so I started, you know, I, I was putting together pieces. And in recent years, it feels like there's been so much helpful development of neuroscience and understanding stress and trauma and the relationship between beliefs you know, our, our mental um, content, if you like, what, what our beliefs are about the world, what our thoughts are, what we're feeling, our emotional brain, and our physicality, our physical bodies and what's happening. Um, so I started reading, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a neuroscientist, you know, I'm not an expert in it, but some of the, some of the, Things that I was reading in Peter Levine's work and other people writing about trauma, Judith Herman, um, felt like they were giving me pieces of this puzzle that I was trying to put together. Um, so I ended up with a kind of map um, that said that said something like, in, "In our in our most healthy, calm state, human beings move from action to rest without stress." And I think even that is a radical statement in our culture. I don't, I don't know if I've ever really inhabited that. Mm. You know, I feel like our culture is so pervaded by stress. Um, 
anyway, so, so, but I think there is a possibility, uh, and I read John Young's book about uh, what the robin knows, and he was describing that as a ground state for creatures in nature, because it's very energy efficient. Uh, so we have this ground state, you know, we, we act, we do stuff, we come back, we nurture our relationships, we relax, our parasympathetic kicks in, we go to sleep, we digest, and then, you know, we get woken up and mobilized and out we go. And, and we're in a constant cycle of the day, of the seasons, if we have them and so on. Uh, and then stress comes in, you know, which is good. We want stress. We don't want everything to just be calm all the time because we need stress to develop. Uh, and stress comes in and our nervous system puts us into different ways of managing the stress or um, different responses to it that might include negotiating. Uh, if we can't negotiate our way out of stressful problems, and a lot of the stresses that we have as social animals are peer-to-peer -peer stress, you know, it's within our social group, it's not actually the predator in the jungle, it's not about being attacked from outside, it's about our social position, our belonging, um, our obedience to the norms and the rules, so that we're not ex excluded. Um, so we can negotiate uh, and then if that's not working, we go to more extreme stress states, which might include things like fawning or trying to appease the other, uh, but it might also include flight and fight, which are the sympathetic nervous system responses that are uh, very commonly known. And, and we know more and more now about the freeze response, which is where the parasympathetic overrides the mobilizing sympathetic response and shuts our whole system down and, and kind of um, paralyzes us. So there's a lot of understanding now about those different responses. Um, and what I saw is that all of this is fine, you know, and all of this would happen in all human cultures throughout time. But what we need is a way of coming out of those, those activated high arousal stress responses that brings us back to a ground state of flow between action and rest. Um, and I was interested in finding, you know, what are these? What, what cultures have had what kind of practices? Mm. Um, and I feel like, you know, I, I uh, worked with Sabon Fusome, um, you know, I uh, did her workshops. And I felt like for, for them, for her people, the Dagara people in Burkina Faso, ritual was a really strong part of that. And grief ceremonies in particular mm. uh, were part of how whatever stresses you've been with, whatever irritations, whatever major losses you've been experiencing or shock or upheaval or injury, they have a weekly grief ceremony and they come and there's rhythm and movement and dance and holding and a fire and song. And you go to the grief shrine and you're supported there and you pour out and you're welcome to move. And then you come back to a, a, a loving welcome where people say, thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your feeling. What, whatever it is mm. and so there's this understanding that in order to keep the emotional um, space of the village clear we need to keep letting go of the of the pain of living and we need to do it through our bodies as well as our feelings mm. and Rob had another one uh, Rob Hopkins from the transition movement interviewed someone at Standing Rock and asked her one of the grandmothers you know what do they do with the people coming back off the front of the front line when they're in that state of shock or the violence impacted, she said, we put them in the sweat lodge. It's like, oh, that's another technology. That's a social technology for creating this re return path. Mm. And I feel like we've only rediscovered it, you know, in, in a way in recent years, Peter Levine's work, um, somatic experiencing, and there's, you know, other much more embodied ways of working with, with trauma. Mm. Um, but I feel like the West is catching up with, you know, cultures that, that, I think had to find these ways because if we don't have that return path, there'll be people walking around in our, in our villages or in our communities mm. that are not connected to the present moment. And I think it's helpful to understand trauma as a residue from an overwhelming moment in the past that is still operating as if it's present in the present moment. Um, yeah. And I think there's also very helpful models around, you know, the, the, the residual structures inside us from trauma. Um, and it may be helpful to talk about those a bit. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested that, you know, we, we have kind of um, 
you know, intact cultures who, who are, who are, you know, using perhaps traditional, perhaps more modern ways to process trauma socially. And we have our kind of physical responses. So we will shake or cry if we've been um, really upset. And that's part of our body's kind of way of, of dealing with and processing that, that trauma. But I, I just wonder what your reflections are on why um, particularly global northern countries have have lost connection with our, you know, presumably at one point we had much more of that kind of shared collective cultural ways of processing um, our, our shared trauma. What, what happened? <laughs> mm. I mean, in some ways, I think that's a, in some ways, I think it's kind of the $50 million question. Mm. Um, Mm. And I'd seen and come across various people's attempts to understand that. Mm. Um, so, I, so for me, there's this landscape that I feel like I've been describing of what a healthy culture includes. So a healthy country includes this ground state and then we have stress and we have possibly shock and things that are overwhelming. But we have these practices that bring us back. Mm. Um, so then I got interested in the question, well, what happens when the whole culture is traumatized? Yeah. What happens when something, an event happens that is so catastrophic or overwhelming that the people that hold the knowledge of those ceremonies or those practices are wiped out or destroyed? And, and then I think the culture moves to a new place where now there's lots of people in that system that have got trauma in them, you could say, um, that are in the, fr the freeze or in the still activated hyper arousal of fight flight uh, that have lost the capacity and we've lost the practices to release that. And that's now who your culture is made up of. You know, people that are easily triggered or very under responsive um, when something happens. So they've lost their capacity to respond appropriately and I think it's helpful to say, you know, again, which is, which is not so widely written about yet, that trauma is not a, it's not a personal event. Mm. Trauma is not the overwhelming thing that happened. Trauma is the failure of the social structures around us to bring us out of the state of freeze. Mm. So, so trauma for me is a collective issue. It's always a collective issue because when we're in that freeze, we can't, necessary you know we can't just get ourselves out of it mm. because we've lost access to our capacity and our ground and our holding mm. so so i think somewhere in all of these cultures that operate like the one i grew up in mm. there's <clears throat> somewhere in the history there are collective events where the the indigenous you know the the practices that were bringing people out of stress states or trauma states have been lost and now the system is organized by stress states, you know, so, so we're organized now by states of consciousness that are run by our physical bodies that are, that are telling us the world is a dangerous place. It's every person for themselves. Um, you know, grab as much power as you can because uh, that other person is, is going to be out to get you or the kind of collapsed place of there's nothing I can do. I'm completely powerless to change anything. And the whole uh, underlying unconscious belief system of the culture is pervaded by the experience of collective trauma, which is life is overwhelming, pain is overwhelming, there's not enough support to hold me. You know, uh, if something bad happens, there's no point in trying to release it because I'm more likely to be punished or shut down or abandoned than held and supported mm. because the elders, the layers of holding of the structures that let that happen have gone. Mm. So we've got wounded people in power with their own inner, very strong survival structures that say, don't feel that it's going to um, stop you from being able to function. You know, part, part of the residue after trauma is to say, uh, don't let those feelings come up because you won't be able to function at all. Mm -hmm. So we end up with these survival structures that are partly keeping the, uh, the memory out, out of awareness, which has been a fantastic 
evolutionary strategy and skill. Um, and then we've got this the survival bit that goes on that can function in the world, but a bit of us is always feeling not quite present. Um, and you know, many people have that experience of, of you know they get to meditation or they do yoga or they finally stop all the busyness, which is what a lot of us do to keep this stuff away, or we you know have an addiction, or we soothe it, or we you know we do anything to our pain but feel it medicalize it we pathologize it we ignore it whatever and we finally you know sit and make some space which i think is part of what's happening in this lockdown mm -hmm. and instead of finding peace all of this stuff comes up of anxiety or constantly running thoughts or grief that we have no idea where it's come from and suddenly into the space starts to come all the things that you know we've been deliberately keeping out of awareness because we don't believe there's the resource to deal with it Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you know I think it's interesting to ask that question about global north culture mm -hmm. and I think it's really important to ask that question about organizational culture where what do we do with our pain in in organizations are our tears welcome mm -hmm. are we allowed to speak about our guilt for the suffering that our product is causing you know what what happens and i feel like the culture of organizations itself has come out of a very traumatized culture mm. so part of the culture of being a professional is that you're managing your emotions and you're not bringing them into the workplace mm. and if you do that you're seen as unprofessional or too weak or too something to actually uh to actually yeah be be a, a competent adult professional let's say and i think that's part of you know that's one of the structures and patterns of our culture that is killing us mm. is that uh we have you could say you know lots of people have written about it psychopathic organizations because they don't have a capacity to relate to the pain and you're required to cut that bit of you off when you come to work mm. on the whole i mean it's not it's not you know, it's not universally true and there's organizations that are trying to do things differently mm. so yeah i mean and and following on from that for me our relationship to pain personally and collectively is an absolutely core organizing principle of whether human cultures are healthy or not it's absolutely central so as an engineer <laughs> you know i look at pain and i say that is the most important feedback signal in a human culture because pain is telling you, suffering is telling you when you're out of relationship. It's telling you when your cultural patterns aren't working. Mm -hmm. You know, it's telling you when something is going wrong. So to, to cut that off and, and not have spaces where we not only feel it, but where we feel it together and make meaning of it as a collective phenomenon mm -hmm. kind of completely paralyzes us from understanding the predicament we're in. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm just really kind of thinking about the, the, the depth to which that's embedded and the kind of negative feedback loops that are kind of stitched in that, that make it so difficult, not just to feel the pain, but to even to even um, countenance the idea that it might be OK. And I'm, I'm thinking of the kind of dominating um, uh, principles that exist in, you know, across a lot of the, the kind of structures that we have, uh, across, certainly across politics and a lot of, you know, social work and our attitude to health is, is a lot about domination and control, which, which is a fear response. Um, but then there's also, you know, underneath that, there's this kind of ridicule. So, so people who might be trying to um, find ways to uh, uh, be different and, and be more connected, can often end up at the, the you know the butt of jokes um well they can end up as the butt of jokes they can end up in mental hospitals can't they yeah. you know yeah. uh and and having a diagnosis of a mental condition mm. that is increasingly being turned into a physical brain disorder mm. yes you know and and Bessel van der Kolk stuff about you know uh, about trauma and the medicalization of trauma you know, and the inability of, uh, of our system still even to diagnose um, trauma, I think, is really is significant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah it's so it's so kind of it's so well stitched up <laughs> we have it so well stitched up and so well under wraps it it's um you know i think i think that's probably quite a good moment to bring this this uh, part of our conversation to to a close because we're going to look at more in depth at the kind of different cultural responses that that happen in traditional cultures and also that can be created um, between people. Uh, is there anything la last thing you want to say about this kind of like this difficult sort of um, conundrum that we've we've got ourselves into? Before we there's, a, there's a couple of things that I'd, that I'd really like to add um, mm. uh, and one of them is, is to say you know like you say it's all kind of really well stitched up and I think from the place of more privilege it feels like that mm. so, so uh, what we know about the pain in the system for me is absolutely related to how much privilege we have in it and I think it's really important to say that and to acknowledge that how it looks if you're poor, black, lesbian or gay, disabled, in terms of your experience of the pain in the system and how it looks, you know, if you're it's somewhere at the other end of those, uh, you know, uh, things that, that can divide or unite us, uh, it's really different. Um, and I think it's one way of understanding systems of privilege is is that it's a way of coping with unmanageable feelings by creating systems of compensation um, you know and one way of understanding uh, these big social systems like patriarchy or colonization is that a group managed to get enough power to put their trauma into somebody else mm -hmm. you know so underneath these these big social systems that look like they're about power, I think a different frame and a different lens to look through is to look at uh, what those people's capacity for dealing with pain and how are they managing their pain. And, and for me, that really links and, and helps us to see why the people with the most privilege and, and, and supposedly the most power are also the most fragile in the system because actually they, don't, they haven't learned to deal with shame, guilt, suffering, um, harm, you know, they've been kind of, they've, they've been protected in the system and then they'll keep the system going, feeling unable to manage the consequences of losing that system. Mm -hmm. So that's one bit, you, you know, and for me, it helps putting trauma underneath, both helps us to see the landscape of conflict, and why it's so charged, why systems of power and privilege are so often entangled with conflict, because who feels what pain and how we respond to it is so conditioned by that. And also it helps us to see why as a system, the people in power would rather drive the system to a collective suicide than change things, you know, because Changing things means letting go of the privilege that's protecting them from having to deal with a whole mass of things that they feel completely ill-equipped to deal with and nothing in their world offers them an understanding of it or a possibility of healing it. Mm. Um, and the last bit that I just want to add uh, yeah. is to come back to that original that I started with that story of working with clients and seeing that there was this shift. Um, and for me, the shift is, is to do with, uh, I, I, I think there are two very deep psychological frames that operate within us. And when I say psychological, I mean mental, emotional, physical, or um, ways in which we're organized. Mm -hmm. And one of them is the one where we can access a feeling of being connected, valued, resourced, safe, empowered, um, we have those experiences. I mean, some of us may have very, very little of that or even none, but most of us had some of that where there was enough secure attachment for us to get a sense of self-worth. So there's a, there's a sort of whole physical organization in ourselves where we have ground and we can feel confident to go out and meet the world. 
and then something triggers us, you know, something that reminds us of an early experience, of an unprocessed, um, something that happened to us later, you know, something that we might call trauma, something that's left us with a residue, and we're suddenly tripped into the landscape of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and that landscape is pervaded by fear and a feeling of isolation, um, a feeling that there's no holding, uh, and, and our nervous systems will, will do different things in order to cope, either under-respond or over-respond, or, you know, um, take us out, dissociate, take us out completely. And for me, that's what's happening when we're in charged conflict, is there's always some sense of threat, whether it's to our belonging or our physical safety or to our access to resources, where we're in this, uh, where both sides are in this um, tr triggered landscape of trauma. Mm -hmm. So if one person is still holding the ground, we can often find our way out of it. Um, but when we're both triggered, that's when conflict starts to feel like an escalating fight to the death or, you know, something that's unmanageable and out of control. Mm -hmm. And it's because we're accessing those parts of ourselves that did feel out of control, but somewhere back in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, again, that's a really helpful map of, of what's happening when we're in conflict together. Mm -hmm. So thank you for letting me include that bit you know uh, absolutely it feels so familiar i can feel it i can feel it in my body you know just just from really recently of, of having that gone through that dance and it's so important that what, what i was i was kind of groping for you know a, a way of dealing with that in the moment and i feel like the point is that there isn't once you've once you've been tripped into that state you're not coping and it's only through taking that away and and working on it and seeing this as a kind of a process of growth over time that you can maybe start to get your head around and, and you, like you were saying before kind of find your way back to the bit of you that, that can cope because within that state it's like the the definition of it is you're not coping or you're you know your 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 nervous system is is finding different ways but it's it's such a kind of painful and uncomfortable place to be in yeah yeah, yeah i mean we're going to talk more in an, in, a, in another one of these <clears throat> about about the way out yeah. it? But, but developing that witness place is absolutely key mm. and and for me that's part of wanting to share the sort of cognitive understanding because once our brain has got an understanding you know, it's like I'm lost in the landscape. If I've got a map, I can, you know, some part of me can go, oh, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Even while I'm still completely lost, if I know that I'm here, you know, I, I can start to organize things a bit differently. So maybe that's a good, good place yes. to end. <laughs> yes. Thank that's, you, Eva. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Lo really lovely to, to listen to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.